He's going to talk this evening about farming in New Hampshire. Uh, we'd like to welcome Ed. Good evening. Um, the advertisement might be a little misleading. Um, I'm not a historian. I don't really know what went on a long time ago. I don't particularly care what went on a long time ago. I more care what goes on today because it's going to affect tomorrow more such than what happened. However, our farm, which is Ledgewood Farm on 171, has been in our family since 1949. And so there is some history there just in the nature of that. And the property as such was established back in, in 1913. Uh, as far as the buildings that are presently there were all constructed in 1913 and 1914. But one, one little tidbit that, that we do have in our family, and I don't know how many of these exist, <laughs> but this is called Baltimore to the 20th Century. And it was printed in 1963. So even that in itself is getting on in years and still in really good shape. But what it has is a really good synopsis of farming in New Hampshire from the time of the 1700s of settlement to the 60s. And during that time, there were two or three major changes in farming in, in Moultonboro. There was the beginning where all the settlers were just subsistence farming. They took care of themselves and their immediate family or, or a group of families, uh, which actually is turning back that way. There's more and more um, families that are four or five different groups, whether they're distant relatives or close relatives. Um, and they are starting to, some will grow animals, some will grow vegetables, some will you know, do canning and so forth. There's much more of that showing up now than there was, say, 20 years ago. And then, of course, we moved into um, the sheep era in Moultonboro, which hit most of New England. Um, it was going to be the, you know, the, the new resurrection of agriculture and move us, move us forward. And it lasted for a few years, and then, of course, it disappeared. Um, but most of the area, from the Austin Mountains to Lake Wambasaki, that entire side hill and flat, was, for, was, was taken out of forestry into pasture and fields. And now, of course, I brought a map tonight from the 70s showing basically the few pieces of farmland that are left were the cream of the crop out of those parcels. And that's why they're still being farmed today. And for the sheep, you will find up on the side of the mountains and, and all the ridges, um, whether they be on Red Hill or up in the Sandwich Range or in the Ossipes, you'll find stone walls, remnants of barbed wire fence in the middle of nowhere where you had no idea that there was ever farming that far up the hill. And so it's, it's interesting to, to walk those trails, or I prefer not to walk the trails, um, <laughs> because you find some things there that, that nobody else might see. And growing up right at the base of the Ospreys since I was three, I spent a lot of time there. And it's amazing, the stone walls and the fences, the old burn marks from the forest fires on some of the trees that survived. And, and they're you know, a couple hundred years old, and they're, they're, they're still growing. So, but this, if you ever happen to see one or a vintage like this, it's a really neat read. Um, and it does a thing that I can't. It has the names, the dates, you know, who was, who was this and who didn't like him. So, it's, it's all in there. And so, what happened with our farm is it had been through a, a number of owners before 1911, um, when Tom Plant started his uh, land gathering for his estate, um, which is now Castle in the Clouds. Our farm was the model farm used in the support for his mansion, Castle in the Clouds now, um, and also the area on Bald Peak and so forth. And what he called it was a model farm. And it was 
designed after what was going on in West Germany, Switzerland, and Bavaria, as you would be a completely self-sustaining, independent farm that would grow and raise everything that you needed. And so the vision he had for, for the farm that we're currently at was to be a completely self-sufficient entity all to itself. And at the same time, he used it in the construction of the <coughs> castle for housing a lot of the laborers, managers, and so forth in the, in the farm buildings that we have. And this is one that it's going to be hard to see, but this is just a picture of what it was like in 1927 when it first went up for sale as, as things were starting to dissolve with the plant's estate. And the buildings have pretty much, we've kept them intact, changed a few windows here and there. We did lose the carriage shed, which is to connect the two large buildings together, um, just because of the, the location. Um, some of it went to disrepair over the years that it, that it was basically neglected. Others, there was a ceiling height of about here. <laughs> and after a while, I got really tired of being here. So, we, we tore them down and put up uh, modern buildings for that purpose. But this is a picture of what it looked like back um, close to the era when it was constructed. And so the, the chronology kind of it falls apart for me a little bit in the middle. My nephew, when he was 12 years old, did a report they, in his, I think it must have been fifth or sixth grade, they had to pick a unique property in Moulton and do a research project on it. And he actually puts me to shame with the work that he did, and the, the trail that he found by going to the registry and deeds and so forth, of the complete chronology from when the plant had it up to, to when my parents bought it and subsequently I bought it. Uh, but it kind of falls along from 1927 to 29 to 41. There were a number of owners um, in between. Somebody would have it for a few years, and then it would generally went to auction or bankruptcy. Someone else would try it for a couple of years. It would go through the same process. And so finally in 1949, um, my uncle, Herbert Person, was able to purchase the property, um, the farm property in 39 acres. And what was happening with Plants of State of Person over the years is it went from multiple thousands of acres to people buying off small chunks. And a little anecdote to that is, as I've been told, the only property that I know of in the area that he wasn't, or one of the very few, that he wasn't able to acquire was actually where Will and Marion Powers live now, which we own that in the, in the 60s and 70s and then sold it off over time. And the land that my um, nephew currently owns um, that are adjacent to their house. He wasn't able to get that property from the Fosting. And that was a real thorn in his side because it was right at the boundary of the Osprey Park Road at 171, kind of like interfered with his whole control of that mm -hmm. entire area. So I guess if you have enough perseverance, you can hold out against others, but it, I think their life was pretty miserable as the story goes, that, that he was not the nicest neighbor when you had something he wanted. And I'll, I'll leave that at, at that point. <laughs> and then so my... My aunt Beverly A. Person and my uncle Herbert Person um, purchased in 1949, had the property until 1955, when unfortunately at a, at a young age he, he passed away. Um, rumor has it was a heart attack. Uh, the family believes that he was working as an engineer on the Los Alamos nuclear project, and in that 1940s era um, and into the 50s, I don't think they really knew what they were doing. And a lot of the scientists were exposed to levels that, that were ultimately um, health problems showed up that, that might otherwise not look like they were affected by radiation. Anyways, he passed away in 55. And nobody in the family was able to purchase the farm at that time. And so it went into another set of hands for a couple of years. Um, came into disrepair, um, the, the owner, left without turning off the water, allow the animals to run upstairs in the house. They found hoof prints on the stairs going up to the second floor uh, for the horse. 
Um, and just in two years, it was amazing what, what had happened to the property. And so fortunately, in 1957, my parents, who were quite young at the time still, um, were able to buy it uh, at auction from the bank. Um, and at the time, of course, a lot of you will remember this, in 1957, my dad was a school teacher, and his annual salary was about $2,000. And so they bought the property with $1,000 down and $16,000 note in the bank. And a $16,000 note feels like, eh, that's nothing. Well, in, in those dollars, it was a significant investment in a, in a gamble. Um, so they moved to Moulton Borough. Um, I was three, my sister was six. And um, we started a new life with my other uncle, Richard, and um, continued the, the farm and expanded some operations, started a poultry operation, had the vegetables, um, cut firewood on the property, and so forth. My dad, when they moved here, he became the principal at the Central School um, until Kingswood High School opened. Then he went down as a teacher and administrator down there. And my mom was a full-time farmer. Um, and so as time went on and we grew older, it, it became necessary to expand even more to make it so the farm would, would, pay, would pay the bills. And so we went into a contract growing situation with a couple of um, poultry breeders. And what we were actually doing on our farm was working on perfecting the, the meat market for chicken. At the time, the conversion was like two to three pounds of chicken feed to create one pound of chicken meat, which was really inefficient. And as the cost of grain was going up, the goal of the breeders, without doing genetic engineering like we have today, which wasn't even in their, in their vision back then, was through selective breeding, just like all the breeders of plants and vegetables, um, was to get a, as close to a one-to-one -one conversion as they could. So because our farm here in central New Hampshire, there weren't a lot of chicken flocks, there weren't a lot of backyard flocks anymore that, that had kind of gone away, we were one of the few areas in the country that was actually tested salmonella free. And we all know salmonella poisoning ties a lot back into, into poultry products because it's a, it, chickens are a carrier of salmonella and doesn't necessarily affect them as a disease. And so because we were clean, it allowed them to have a flock that was, that was able to be moved all over the country and all over the world without worrying about being quarantined. And so from the 60s until 1987, we did various research projects um, with Hubbard Farms, um, cob breeding, cone egg company, and so forth, doing a lot of hatching of, of eggs from our flocks on the farm. The, Geneticists from the company would come and select the birds that were going to go for, for breeding, and then the others, of course, became poultry or egg laying uh, chickens. And then in 1987, the company that we were raising for got this wonderful idea. They were going to consolidate their entire business and move it to Arkansas. Cheap grain, cheap fuel, cheap labor, and putting all their eggs in. <laughs> one basket, and therefore opening themselves up to a disease catastrophe. And there, fortunately, there were enough you know, medications and so forth that the, the company survived and, and went on and prospered, which now a company that bought it was Tyson Foods. And we all know Tyson Chicken. Um, but at the end of it, in the last two or three years, we were actually a quarantine farm. No one could come onto the farm in the poultry flock except for one USDA veterinarian and one employee from Cobb Breeding, and those of us in, in the family. We had to screen to keep any stray birds out. Everyone that came on the property had to sanitize, put on coveralls, and so forth. And what they were trying to do is create a chicken for the Asian market, meaning Asia, India, and, and other parts of Asia and China, that would be as efficient as possible at converting grain into meat. And that was at the point where we got out of the poultry business because the company um, picked up and moved to Arkansas. So that was the end of our chicken business. And it just happened to be at that same time, 
things called greenhouses really start to take off as a way for farmers to start making more money in a longer season, less risk from outside weather conditions. And so we had started to do that. And I guess I'll finish that story and then we'll look at some slides because the slides really are, are a little um, more modern than, than the beginning of the story. And so what, what happened was we had some old cedar and glass greenhouses that we had bought used back in the early 60s. And then we started building ones out of wood because we could do it ourselves with our own lumber. Polyethylene sheeting, believe it or not, in the late 60s was only when it started to develop as a product that would, would be used widespread, where now polyethylene, of course, is used everywhere for everything. But it was a very new product at that time. And it was one of the first times in the late 60s that it actually had any life expectancy. If you buy a piece of plastic clear sheeting at, at the hardware store, you put it up on a window, five or six months, it disintegrates. Well, that's not going to work in a growing environment where you might try to get one, two, or three, four years out of the plastic. So they started to generate polys that were ultraviolet resistant, which is the ray from the sun that breaks plastic down. And that's why if you can leave plastic on top of the surface, it has a chance to disintegrate. If you bury it in the ground, it's going to be there you know, for, for millions of years. And so the whole key was to try to find a plastic that was economical, easy to work with, and would last a number of years so that the farmer wouldn't be spending all their time changing plastic or losing their crop because they neglected to, to change it the day before it disintegrated. And so what, what also happened is that wood started to become a little more expensive. You have the daily maintenance and the yearly maintenance of, of trying to keep wooden structures together, which, you know, as a, as a group, they're trying to keep buildings together. Even though they've got a roof on them, they still tend to, to, to deteriorate. And so we started working with metal pipe frames. And we bought a few, had marginal success with a couple of the manufacturers we bought from. So we ended up buying our own equipment and started building it for ourselves. Very shortly after that, we started selling to other growers. And now, in the course since 1987 to now, which is 25 years, we've sold between six and 7,000 greenhouses to other farmers in the United States to help them make their farm more successful. There's a lot of various vendors out there, manufacturers. We have a niche in that we farm. And so we use the structures and we can help educate the, these growers that have never, never seen a greenhouse before in how to use them and have success. And that's our best advertising tool, is that we provide that expertise through our using them for 40 plus years. And so it's a, it's a very important part of our farm. Uh, we still farm. We have 22 greenhouses that we grow in ourselves. From the road, you don't necessarily see them. We've, done a, we've tried really hard to keep them back as much as we can. So not to take away from the, from the picturesque of the, of the building and, and the, whole, the whole area. And so they are tucked in behind the buildings, down on levels, so they're out of sight. But there are 22 greenhouses on the property that we use, either heated for growing seedlings, um, greenhouse tomatoes, and, and a lot of other vegetables that most everyone just thinks of, well, they only grow outside. We grow sandwich onions inside of a greenhouse so that we can have them on the stand last week. Where you wouldn't see sandwich onions in your garden until late August, planning on having them for storage. So, let's look at a couple of pictures. So that's who we are. Um, that's been our logo for a number of years, just using the, the classic barn from the, from the Tom Plant era as our, as our signature. Um, and so this is, for those of you that aren't familiar, we are on Route 171, right past the um, exit road for the Castle of the Clouds or the entrance for the balling plant and functions. Um, it's a building that's about 45 feet wide, 120 feet long, uh, about 45 feet to the peak eave. Uh, and the cupola stand about another 17 feet above that. <coughs> Anyone that's been in the building trade, there's 110 square of shingles on that roof, which means it's about the size of four to five normal houses. Uh, when we had it re-shingled two years ago, 
it was just $35,000 just to put shingles on it, say nothing about stripping it and redoing it. And so this is one of the problems with these large old buildings, which, again, you, you are aware, is that the expense to maintain them. And so my goal is to have the buildings in as pristine a shape as I can going into my later years when the income will probably go down just because of I run just as fast, but not as long, I guess. Or I think I'm running as fast, but I don't get there as quick. Whatever it is, we're trying to set ourselves up so that we can maintain the farm property going down the road until we really decide what we're going to do with it. And so keeping paint on new roofs and so forth. Um, but it's just we're really proud of the building and, and the way we've been able to keep care of it over the years. Um, and I don't know if it shows enough size there so you can see it. Um, the copper flashing, something I learned about shingles, another little side note. I'm not sure how much time we have, but we're, we're, that's, co that's copper flashing along, along the eaves. The last shingles were put on 20 years ago, everybody thought copper was too expensive, so they started using galvanized steel and to some point aluminum. Well, the benefit of copper is it's actually, as we know in vegetable production, it's a fungicide. And so if you looked at my barn five years ago, it had all black streaks running down the shingles. It looks like you would dump black paint on it. Well, all it was is an algae and mold growing because the galvanized flashing didn't work. There wasn't enough zinc in it to actually leach out and make it work. So the copper, every time it rains, this, it is oxidizing the weather, and the rain washes the copper down, acts like a fungicide to keep the roof pristine. But that copper, there's 480 feet of it. It was about $9,500 just for flashing. <laughs> but looking down the road for the shingles to last 20 to 30 years, it was really necessary because of the... Um, because of the cold attic, it really was just the right temperature for mold to grow. But that's just a little. So if someone's going to re-roof your house, don't use galvanized. <laughs> this is just a picture from the from the barn entrance end. Um, it has an entire stone and mortar foundation, similar to what is up at the castle and at the carriage house. Um, it is in amazingly good shape. Um, when they built it, it was all done by hand, and they used a lot of hands, and they didn't have a problem digging down deep enough, and there are actually perimeter drains around the entire building, even back in 1913. This, this is what we call our cottage. It's actually a seven-room house, about 1,800 square feet, single level. Um, it had at one point a cathedral ceiling in the living room. And back in the 60s, when we were trying to heat it with a coal stove before there was any central heat, and my parents had two young children, actually headed off and got rid of the cathedral and now have just a, you know, an eight or an eight and a half foot um, drywall ceiling. Um, but that building was used as a, as a residence for a, I would call a mid-level manager. There was a great room in the center, a kitchen, and then there were two independent rooms, and then there were five small rooms about this big, say seven by ten, that were used for individual employees as far as their, their bedrooms. And over the years, a lot of those partitions were taken out. They tried to have four people live in the house, decided to take out some of those small rooms and make a larger room. But it is, it's just a really neat building. Um, I haven't lived there since the 60s. I've rented it out. My family always seems when they went away, they came back, sister, brother, nephew, and so forth. They kind of land there, be there for six or eight years or so, and then move on to their own house. And as it is, my nephew had been there for the last 10 years, and he has just moved up to my mother's house um, that's up on the side of Bosby Park Road. Um, and then my mother, of course, has moved down to, to West Wing. So things do kind of work their way around. Um, this is just another 
I guess I missed it the slide. Maybe the, maybe the slide that I thought was going to be next is, is hiding in there somewhere. We'll see. Um, this is a view from the Osprey Park Road, looking down over towards the farm and out towards the the, the mountains in the back. Um, these back here, that's part of the Ragged Mountain and, and the mountains out to the, um, to the um, I guess southwest would be the direction. And there's, there's just a front. We had closed in the, it was an open porch, just put the, the uh, partial deck there to put screening on so we could use it as another room. Um, you'll notice the fieldstone um, chimney. Maybe that's the next picture. There it is. It's about 10 feet across. Um, it has a stone mantle. So the mantle is just laid field stone. There's no wood. It's just a stone mantle. And that was the heat source in the building for um, up until the point that my parents put in a coal stove using the opening. The stove we had just fit right there. And, and that was how we heated it until it was finally um, oil forced hot air put in. And they, in the uh, later 60s. But it's all beadboard inside, all beadboard trimmed, the entire house. Um, some of it has been covered over because the beadboard had, again, gotten some damage over the years when it was in. Nobody really cared. I think that house got less care than even the, the farmhouse did. So some of it's been replaced with, um, with drywall. But. This is a very similar building is, is still standing today. Um, that's where we started back in the in the early 60s, uh, mid 60s actually. We had a stand down in the dooryard in part of the old carriage house, and then we decided for visibility and to get people out of the dooryard, we put it up on the side of the road, and that sold a lot of pounds of produce through it over the years. We still use it in the spring and in the fall as a self-service setup. We can do it there really well, or if we tried to do it on Route 25 self-service, it probably wouldn't be quite as successful. <laughs> um, so things that we're doing to try to make it so the farm will be easier, lower expenses going down the next 10 years, let's say I'm 57, my wife's 55, um, start thinking about how many years can we run as fast as we are. So we, about five years ago, we put in a wood-fired boiler. And this runs, heats the big house, it heats the cottage, it heats our manufacturing shop where we build the greenhouses, and four greenhouses themselves. And that's not a, a blown up picture. That's me actually standing in front of it, and that's how big it is. And it's one and a half million BTUs of heat it will produce per hour. And your normal household furnace is somewhere probably between 80,000 and 150,000 is what a normal house furnace will, will produce. The last three years, we've been averaging about 60 cords of firewood that, that goes through that in the course of the year to heat the buildings that we do. But it's replacing about 7,000 gallons of fuel oil. Is what we used to burn to heat the greenhouses and the shop and, and the two houses. And this year, I'm sure you're all well aware, or most are, some may have propane now, that fuel oil was up $3 and some per gallon. And so when you start looking at that quantity, we're, we're up in the twenty to thirty thousand dollars just for fuel to heat the heat the farm. With the wood, sixty quarts, I figure I can do a quart of wood for about one hundred and twenty-five dollars. So we're at about eight or nine thousand dollars. So we reduced it significantly now. Ten years ago, burning wood was just because you liked the exercise. Oil was so inexpensive, propane so expensive, it didn't make any sense to to burn wood. Now it is definitely, it's an, it's a, it's an economical um, factor for the farm. That's a portion of the wood. Um, I've gotten smarter in the last two years. We've gone to using two foot wood. It's lighter to throw, but you have to throw twice as much. And in the spring, in March and April, when we're in full production, we're putting almost a half a quart of wood through that a day. So we're talking about a ton of wood that gets thrown into that fire every day. Now onto the part where what has really transformed the farm to make it so that it's still economically feasible in, in this day and age are the greenhouses. And both in the manufacture that we do, but also in the use of them um, ourselves. And 
they're pretty inexpensive. It's three to four dollars per square foot you can build a greenhouse for the, for the application that we have. Versus the house nowadays is up over a hundred dollars a square foot. So it's a really inexpensive space um, to have for, uh, for growing vegetables in. And that's not a very good picture because it was taken a few years ago. Um, but in those, we grow the crops that you normally wouldn't see for another two or three or four weeks in your own garden or, or at a farm stand. Things like summer squash, zucchini, cucumbers, as I spoke, sandwich onions, you can grow garlic, um, tomatoes, of course, which is a huge market for us, um, raspberries, strawberries, and that's where all of our, our fruit is coming from now, is basically out of the greenhouses. And my farm is a no-spray farm, which means we don't use any chemicals at all. We're not organic, because organic you can use chemicals that have to be certified and so forth. So we have a no-spray farm. There's a lot of challenge there. One of the challenges we can take out is a lot of the diseases, the molds and mildews and things that really attack, especially small fruit like raspberries. Raspberries are just mold waiting to happen. You know, you leave them on the counter for a day and they're just gray and fuzzy. Um, so by growing them under cover, keeping the rain off, we can control the temperature by opening and closing them. We control the humidity by how much water we give them. And we keep the rainfall off. So we can pick every day that there are actually berries that are right to pick without worrying about whether it's raining outside or whether it's, it's you know, too hot. We use um, plastic materials to keep the shaded so they stay cooler and so forth. So it's really made a huge difference in, um, in the way our farmers worked. This is just an example of what we can avoid by growing more crops inside. I wish I could grow corn inside, <laughs> but I calculate it would be about $20 to $25 a dozen to do that. I could have corn in May, but I still don't think you'd want to pay that price for an ear of corn. Um, you go out to dinner, you pay eight or nine bucks for a glass of wine that seems to be getting smaller every year. Um, so maybe, you know, three bucks, two bucks or three bucks for an ear of corn isn't, isn't that outrageous um, in the whole scheme of things. And that was one thing I, 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 I hope I don't forget to mention in a little bit, um, is about the prices and how things have changed in certain areas and not in others. This, this looks like a big, a big pillow. Um, and sometimes when the wind's blowing and you drive by the farm, it looks like there are elephants walking around in, underneath this sheet. And all this is a polyester, um, some of them are polypropylene, woven material that allows rain, light, ventilation to go through it, and it makes a mini greenhouse without having the structure of a greenhouse. It gives us a little boost. Um, it'll push corn by two weeks over it if you don't put it underneath one of these covers. Um, it keeps insects, like striped cucumber beetle, out of cucumbers and squash, which if any of you have those, or potato beetles out of eggplant and potatoes, you know what they can do when you go out the next day and they were fine and tomorrow they're half eaten. So these are just some tools that, that modern day farmers are using that weren't available in the 30s and 40s. They have been available since the 60s. And now they're just, you'll see them every, any vegetable farm you go buy in New England, you're gonna see things like this out there, in, in, especially in April and May, but also sometimes all summer. And that's just the size. Those are 50 feet wide and about 500 feet long of those sheets. And it only weighs about 100 pounds for that whole huge sheet. So it's a really light material. And this is our goal, to have things that you can actually eat at a time when anybody cares. And we all know that a tourist area like Moultonboro is with the lake, a farm business really survives from the end of June until the middle of August. It used to be the end of August, now it's the middle of August because sports are starting, schools are starting before Labor Day, everybody has to go home and get their school shopping done. And so it really is compressed into about a seven week season of, of high sales. The rest of the time, the folks that live here certainly support us and appreciate that, but the reality is there aren't enough of us um, to, to do it. So we really have to concentrate that short season. And, and those are tomatoes. We've been picking tomatoes out of that house I took that picture a week or so ago for about three weeks. 
where anybody that has a garden, anybody have a garden? Yeah. And you got your tomatoes, are they about this big and nice and green? <laughs> and maybe the leaves are turning brown and all these other things, purple and all that other stuff. Yeah. So this is one of the benefits. Three of the greenhouses we heat with a wood-fired boiler are tomato houses, so that we can have tomatoes now. And then we have some others that are just undercover, protected from the weather, but no supplemental heating. So it's, again, if you don't just throw the seeds in the ground anymore and hope they grow, we're doing a lot of things to try to manipulate them that we didn't used to have. These are cucumbers. Not many people trellis the cucumbers out in the gardens. It's not worth the time, because the striped cucumber beetle and the mold are going to get them before they grow very tall anyways. These will grow from June all the way to October. We have window screen on the sides of the greenhouse and on the doors. And I used to have signs up that said, these doors must be kept closed to the penalty of death <laughs> for my employees. I didn't really explain to them whether it meant them or the plants were going to die if they left the door open. But that little bit of ambiguity, you know, kind of made it pretty effective so the doors were always shut. Um, but it, it makes a crop that normally we think of as only a two or three, maybe four week crop that you can harvest off it. We can do it for three or four months. So by just keeping them dry from the rain and keeping the striped cucumber beetle and the squash bugs out. This, believe it or not, is a picture taken in February. By using the greenhouse itself and then suspending either another layer of plastic or one of those floating covers that we saw out in the field, we can actually maintain temperatures inside for hardy greens like spinach, some of the lettuces, and some of the other herbs right through the winter. Carrots, beets, Swiss chard, kale. So this has become a huge market for a lot of my customers that buy greenhouses. So now they're able to farm 12 months a year if they want to. I still have some friends that I'm included that say, you know, 10 months is enough. <laughs> Let's take a couple months. One, you let the, the soil rest and, and freeze up a little bit but also you allow yourself to recharge. But it is very effective technique. Um, and then here's the, here's the point I didn't want to forget. That's my, a picture of my Uncle Richard um, somewhere between 1960 and 1962. Um, I believe that's a 1951 or 52 tractor. It came with the farm, they threw it in, you know, it's part of the part of the package. This is a picture of my dad on a 1960 tractor we bought brand new with a set of plows, which some of you may not know what those are, but the things you turn dirt with. A set of harrows and the tractor was $2,000 in 1960. We ran that tractor for as our primary tillage tractor for about 25 years. This tractor, not the little one that my, my, my grandson is sitting on. Um, this one here, um, I just replaced it last year, and it was $92,000. I don't think the price of tomato has gone from about a buck a pound in the 60s to, I don't know, three ninety-nine dollars a pound, which is a lot of money. Correlates quite the same as going from a $2,000 tractor to a $92,000 tractor. But that's the reality of it. If you have a piece of equipment that you can reduce the amount of labor you have to hire, which labor on my farm is the most expensive input that I have. It's 40% of our total expenses is just in labor to get the crops planted, weeded, harvested, and sold. And that's a huge chunk. If you're in industry, you're probably looking at a labor is maybe in the teens. But in farming, it's just become a huge impact. So that was the correlation I wanted to show between the $2,000 tractor. Obviously, this one is bigger, has more horsepower, and so forth. But it's still doing a job of just turning the dirt so you can plant. Things we've gone to to protect ourselves in this world that we live in now as far as liability and so forth, these are called John Deere gators. We used to use all-terrain vehicles with a trailer. So people would sit on top of them. You know, two people hanging on tandem, they're going through the fields to pick, pick and bring the produce back. They go too fast. These, you sit in it, 
They've got a cargo area that's attached, so nobody has to worry about backing up and tipping the thing over because the trailer jackknives or something. But this is what we've gone to. A pickup truck costs, what, I just bought one last year, $42,000. These, when we started buying, were about $4,000. To do the same thing, get you two people from the, the yard where we would process the vegetables to the field of back. And so these became necessary so you could keep the expense of, of, the, of the other vehicles down. And just because it's kind of warm in here tonight, I thought this was kind of neat. Probably, well, you know, because we, we talked, you cheated. Um, maybe somebody's aware of where that is. Probably not. It's not very far away. That was at the gatehouse at the castle, the back gate, up at the top where the fields are, in the winter of 69 and 70. This right here is the top of the pillar for the gate. Okay? And that's basically one storm. Now, one storm and then the second storm when they plowed it and just made it that much deeper. That's my brother when he was probably nine or ten years old. Um, but the only way to get through that is they got front end loaders and just in bulldozers and chopped their way through. Because at the time there were people still living up there um, and at the carriage house and at the castle. There were, there were some people up there renting. They actually were doing weekend rentals and stuff. But it's just kind of a neat. It's, I have never seen it like that since that winter. And two years ago we had a really snow winter, but it was not even anything. What was that 69, did you say? 69, 70. Yeah. We were um there were three days we could not get out of Route 171. So anyways. That's most everything. I have a few miscellaneous things that I brought if anyone wants to look at for a couple minutes. One is a report my nephew did when he was in school. <laughs> summer. And, and that actually has details about the summer, like when we started changing businesses and, and so forth. And I can leave it for a few minutes. I think you're going to have some snacks. And if anyone wants to, they can certainly look at those um, afterwards. This is one of my prides that we came by back a number of years ago. And I, there's one hanging out in the, in the other room, not quite as detailed as this. But this is just a topographic map showing Lake Winnipesaukee is the big blue to the lower, lower part. Um, Ossipee Lake is over here. But this is the Ossipee Mountains. And it's one of the most pronounced extinct ring dikes in the world. And we happen to live right here. So the white, the tannish areas, those are all fields. So the tan is field, the green is woods, the blue is lake, of course. And so these are the remnants of what was at one time. This entire perimeter right here, all the way to the lake, was field. And over time, the less desirable land was um, was converted back into forest and now into houses and so forth. I was going to bring another aerial photo taken in 1970 showing the effect of Swissvale and Balmoral because mm -hmm. it was just in the early stages of development. Mm -hmm. And right down in here, it is just stars and crisscross of roads. Mm -hmm. It looks like you went on and... Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the total effect has, hasn't been significant as far as the feel of the area. Mm -hmm. But it, on that aerial photo, it's dramatic how it changed. Um, and so most of this tan that is still here does still exist as field. Most of it's used for hay fields, some used for wildlife. Um, there's our, ourself uh, and one or two other small farms in town are the only ones that still um, produce horticultural crops off of it. But it's just, I've always liked this picture showing the, the dramatic. And, and as you start hearing about things, say, oh, the Austin Mountains is one of the, you know, really pronounced rain dikes, and, and this is the picture that allows you to really see the effect of it. And it's a mountain range, it's about 13 miles across from one side to the other. Doesn't look very big there. But that's, that's how large it is to get from, from here to West Ossipee on Route 16, it's about 13 miles.
have some refreshments. Carol Brandberg and Marie Samaha have brought in some refreshments for everybody, so please. And walk around the buildings, um, take your time, enjoy, and thanks. You're welcome. Hello, Brandberg. Like that name?